Hey, today I want to talk about performance in React applications. Uh, the reason I think this is important is because React has really kind of hit critical mass and there's so many people building applications in React. And uh, when React first came out, the virtual DOM was the feature that was sort of touted as uh, the thing that makes React fast. And we had all those demos that came out from people kind of showing the differences between React and other uh, single page app frameworks or JS heavy frameworks like Angular and Ember. Uh, and React kind of outperformed them in some of these tests. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that that led to was people sort of just pulling React in and uh, thinking, oh, because the virtual DOM's fast, then I don't really need to think about my application's performance. And I've seen that play out in a number of places in code bases. And I think it's, uh, it's problematic because it kind of... Um, it almost defers responsibility for performance to the framework or the library, in the case React's a library. And uh, that that's challenging because uh, I think as developers, we always need to be concerned with performance, especially in an era where we're shipping more and more megabytes of JavaScript to the browser, treating the browser as a runtime, uh, and then kind of throwing caution to the wind and saying, uh, we don't really need to worry about performance because the library is going to take care of it for us. So with this screencast, what I wanted to kind of talk about was um, using an example, a common scenario for React components maybe that you might be using in like a line of business application, which is like a large data table. We've seen a bunch of applications that use uh, sort of the idea of a data grid. Um, and with that, often when a developer is deciding what to do, they will uh, determine that they need to go to Google or Stack Overflow and see what other people are using uh, and then look for a library and they go through this process where they look on GitHub, uh, they try and evaluate some criteria to see, you know, is the library actually legit? Is it going to work? Uh, number of GitHub stars, number of it open issues, last commit, uh, those kinds of things to determine the health of a, of a open source repository. And there's this quest that happens for a pre-built library. And uh, often I think that's the default for developers instead. Um, and when we do that, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I think there's some libraries out there that are there that are really good, that are performant. But uh, we also eliminate um, our ability to objectively evaluate the performance of the code that we're writing. Or maybe we just don't even think about it because it's so easy to do Google and Stack Overflow driven development. So when I like to think about performance goals, um, I like to think... First, I'm going to actually see if I can understand the problem that I'm working on, that, that this React component that is, you know, that I want to build is going to solve. And I like to think about a couple of important metrics, uh, the time to interact, you know, how long does it take for my code to execute in the browser so that my users can actually uh, get to click on things and be able to interact with my application. That's a pretty important metric to think of. And then the other one is time uh, to first meaningful paint. And first meaningful paint is a is a metric that uh, Chrome Developer Tools um, highlights when you do a performance analysis that we'll take a look, look at a little bit later. Uh, but how long does it take the browser to actually compute um, the, the painting part of its lifecycle phase? And that's interesting to look at because there's some uh, relationships between how long that takes and then how long time to interactive becomes. Uh, the idea of setting a frame budget, I think, is a good idea because uh, when you hear the developer ad kits from uh, different teams uh, project sort of the ideal case where you have a really smooth experience for your users at 60 frames per second, which equates to 16.7 milliseconds of execution time uh, per uh, frame, you need to get all that work done in 16.7 milliseconds. That might not always be feasible. So what are trade-offs, right? Does your team decide to set a 30 frames per second budget or a, uh, a 45 frames per second budget and then use that as your benchmark? Just coming up with something that's feasible for your scenario, I think, is is wise and will, will help to alleviate a lot of the, the pain. Um, but even just thinking about it ahead of time uh, is good to have a goal. And then thinking about how do we evaluate performance objectively? What's the feedback loop that we need to go through, right? We talk about fast feedback loops for developers uh, where we want to be able to experiment and type some code and ship and, and then evaluate that. And often we're more concerned about that as it relates to actually writing code. And so what I'd like to show today is like how that feedback loop works when you're evaluating performance, uh, specifically as it relates to React. And then we'll look at some React development patterns. Um, the general sort of life cycle that I've observed uh, it is that you start with a big one component um, with one render method, and then you kind of decompose and break down the, from there. You know, profile it, see where the, the bottlenecks are, and then uh, start tearing it apart. Uh, when you get to that decomposition step, you, you know, you look at limiting the surface area of the props that get passed into your component. Um, you think hard about those props, and, and I like to think of props as sort of a, an indicator 
that a component might be doing too much, especially if you're passing this massive list of props all over the place, right? So we want to cut that list up and then create separate components uh, and then profile and see what the execution time looks like, what the time to interactive looks like when we make those changes and the time to first meaningful paint. Uh, and then we can go through other cadences of optimization. So we can just reduce the amount of JS execution that happens in the browser um, because work that the browser doesn't have to do doesn't need to be optimized. So that's one of the simplest things we can do. Uh, we can reduce the surface area for change. So going from one big component to small components, but maybe not too far down that path. Um, but that limited surface area and that small list of props is sort of the guiding principle can help us get to better performing uh, React code. And then keeping render methods, if you are extending from React component, uh, simple and mostly static is probably the, uh, the next place I'd like to go. So let me take you through the example app that we have here, which is this table component. And we're going to build this from the ground up. But the idea is you're a developer and you have uh, a stakeholder that wants to put a large data table on the screen. This is pretty popular in a lot of enterprise applications. And so one of the, the criteria that the uh, developer uh, program manager, product, project manager rather, for your project is, is, oh, I want the table to be sortable and filterable. So we have uh, a table defined here. We have some data. Uh, in this case, I've got a thousand items because I think it's useful to sort of use a really large number uh, to evaluate because a lot of applications will just chuck a bunch of data on the screen. So there's like a thousand entries in this array. And then some definition of columns, right? In this case, the columns are just mapping to names of keys in the data structure. And I've just driven those right into the data table. Uh, and so when a user clicks on that, um, we can get a sort value. So you can see I clicked on company and we hit the company sort value and we got a sort order of ascending. And when I clicked it again, uh, it reverses that and we get a sort order of descending. And you kind of see there's a little bit of lag there uh, because we're dealing with so many nodes on the page. That's sort of uh, a really problematic um, Thing. We have too many DOM nodes on the page, and our pages are just getting more complex, uh, which is one of the reasons why Chrome DevTools recommends, I think it's like a, a limit of less than 1,500. Maybe it's even 1,250 DOM nodes on the page. Uh, but when you're building something like this, uh, one of the first things that you might do is, is show this to your, your stakeholder, and they say, oh, this is great, but there's a noticeable lag when I click on the columns and the sort happens. And you can even see that reflected in React's DevTools here. And so you might say, oh, well, I don't really need to understand what's happening there and how to evaluate that. And one of the great things that uh, Canary, which is what I'm using here, uh, this is the, the dev channel version of Chrome, uh, they've added a bunch of tools for evaluating that. And so if you go to the audits tab, you can actually do a couple of different audits. I don't know if I can get there. There we go. And I'm going to perform just a performance audit. And what this is going to do is simulate um, a mobile experience on a, a device, because um, mobile is generally a good benchmark for performance, and then give some hard numbers back. Um, so I didn't do the full Lighthouse audit, but this is a great way to just check uh, a really easy set of metrics to, to get a baseline for performance. And you can see that we have some pretty horrible uh, metrics for this code. Our first meaningful paint is at 6.5 seconds, which is really bad. Um, and so that's essentially how long it's going to take until uh, the user can interact with this. So if they're on a phone and scrolling, that's a pretty poor experience. And you can see that there's this number called the perceptual speed index. Um, and it's at 6605 right now. And our target is less than 1250. Um, estimated input latency. So if a user clicks or touches or drags or even uses their mouse, how long does it take? And that, that number is generally pretty good. Um, but the number that I really am interested in when I first start looking at how to how to tackle performance as it relates to React components is just what how many DOM nodes I'm actually putting on the page. And in this case, it's 7,000 with our 1,000 uh, rows in this table. So yeah, you can see the target here is like less than 1500. So this is a, if you, if you need to push back gently on the project manager that wants you to put a thousand table rows on a page, this is a great way to do it, right? Like you can come and say, well, we have this many nodes and this is how many we should have. Um, so maybe we just need to reduce the size, this size of this table or add pagination so that we're not showing so many DOM nodes. And that's sort of in line with the spirit of uh, not making the browser do work that it just doesn't need to do uh, and then you don't have to optimize that code. 
So audits in Chrome DevTools is a great way to get to uh, a baseline of performance indication. Um, there's a couple other tools. Uh, this performance tab, uh, which we'll jump into a little bit later, also um, shows us how to do sort of on the spot performance audits. And we can kind of do something like hit record and hit the sort and then hit the reset sort button and then get a baseline for performance to see uh, how that's going to work. So for this screencast, though, I, I wanted to start out by uh, looking more holistically at where you start with a React component and then the life cycle that it usually takes as it grows into the from this one big component with one render method uh, to carving it up into small pieces. So let's take a look at what that looks like. And I have a simple, this is a create React app um, and my data uh, I just generated with this fake da data generator. So this is where the thousand uh, table rows is coming from. Uh, at first I did 100 and then that wasn't a meaningful sample size because it actually performed really pretty admirably. But uh, I think I wanted to showcase sort of the what I've seen in other applications where it's just so much data that gets rendered to the screen that the browser is little, literally crippled and the user experience is generally not that great. So our data for uh, this table looks like an ID, a name, an address, uh, a company, and return dates, and a return amount. And I'm using a library called Faker. I'm not going to dive into that, but if you want to check it out, I'll put it in the links uh, for the video description. But it's a great way to just generate some random data uh, that you can see rendered to the screen. And if we look in, this is basically the uh, the default boilerplate folder structure that Create React, React app uh, gives you. And I've added two components, one using a core React uh, dot component, and then one using a library called Recompose. But we're going to start with the first one. Uh, so let's add a new component. Um, and we'll put it in app screencast. And this is going to start from scratch, basically. So let's just create that quickly. Uh, we'll put it in app screencast.js. And we'll just start kind of how I described. We'll build the, the big React component and then go from there and see uh, how it sort of evolves. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to import uh, React and component from React. Uh, let's grab our style sheet. Our Webpack can uh, take care of this. Let's grab our data and we'll call it response. I'm just going to import it for now. Uh, at a later time, I might add uh, some more to the screencast that shows what performance metrics look like when you introduce async data fetching into the equation. But for now, we're just going to uh, pull it in from data. Oh, I guess it's, what did I call it? Yeah, data1000.json. And then, uh, so that should be good for now. So let's create our table component and just kind of sketch it out. Uh, it's going to extend from component. Uh, we want some initial state. Uh, we want the uh, the sort. That's going to be what's controlled. Uh, we want the sort order. And then we want another array to track the sorted data so that we can leave our initial data uh, just fine. and um, when we do the click on the table headings, then this is what is going to get rendered out. And so if we think about where to go next, uh, we're going to want a render method. So this is our one big com component. And I'm just going to return. And we need a table. And let's have a header and a body. And uh, we need some table rows in our table body. Uh, we need all, we need also the idea of some props. So in our demo app, for example, if we go back to here and take a look at React, we can see that we passed in a list of column definitions and that data. So let's uh, extract that in the render method. So we can say that, uh, our data and our columns, we can destructure those off the props. And then uh, we can grab values for sort by and sorted data. And those will come from the state when we need them. So in our table body, we're going to iterate over the data uh, to 
map to rows so we can say uh, data uh, dot map and row and then we can insert a I guess we'll want to move that inside and inside for each uh, row we're going to have columns so we'll map over the columns and in the columns we're going to just put a td uh, and output whatever the column was So if we do that and we change our app so that it's not rendering our old React component, but our screencast component, then we should, oh, right, I need to. I need to use that component in something else. Uh, so let's say div and then table. Uh, and then data equals the response dot data, um, but just coming back from data dot JSON, it has a key in it. And we need some columns. So let's just add columns. Oh, I gotta close this guy. Uh, and these are the columns that we want. So we want name, address dot city, address dot country company return date and return amount Let's see if we get a little bit further uh, oh yes we'll leave that at the bottom and app is a stateless functional component that we will export all right so now we have our table and it looks like our iteration isn't quite working. So let's fix that. Uh, let's pull in Lodash so we can actually access the value because to get this value, we want to do something like row at column to get the value. Um, but because we're using these composite keys, um, so address.city, for example, maps to uh, address, and then there's a sub object. Uh, Lodash has a really nice method that we can use called get. So let's just bring in Lodash. And here we can emit um, underscore dot get from the row, the column. We're still not getting a result rendered. Let's take a look at our errors. I can always forget these brackets. Uh, so that needs to be that. And this also needs to be that. Okay, cool. All right, so we get an error right away, um, which is probably one of the first performance optimizations we can do is if we're rendering a list of things, we need a key prop. Uh, we need that so that React can track uh, more efficiently uh, if we're just doing something like sorting these things or drag and dropping so that it doesn't have to re-render the node but it can just uh, pull the previously rendered result and just change the ordering of them so let's just generate some keys for these things so for our table row uh, we can have a key of i think there's row.id and then for our columns uh, we want to do like a composite key uh, so let's add a template literal and we can do um, row.id 
D and then uh, the column. Let's see if that makes it happy. There we go. And so now if we look at that, uh, this is what it will look like if we haven't killed the browser. There we go. So key zero um, for the ID and then zero name, one name, etc. So this is our baseline and we can start right away uh, before we've even added sorting and do some performance analysis on this. So let's go to the performance tab and we'll hit the reload button. And this will just reload the page and give us some metrics uh, around what the, the meaningful interactions are. And one additional thing that I forgot um, is if you're using the development version of React, you can add uh, a query parameter, which is React underscore perf. And that will change how React records instrumentation calls and it'll actually stick them into a user timing section in the performance tools in Chrome DevTools. So if we run this performance tool again, now we can see uh, there's a whole bunch of execution stuff here at the beginning. Um, so our app took 213 milliseconds to mount and our table took 210 milliseconds and the table render method took 35 milliseconds. And so if we look at these, the blue line here, uh, the blue line is when the DOM content loaded event occurred. The red line is the load event and the green line is our first meaningful paint. So technically, even though uh, this script execution finished, you can kind of see when that occurred. If we zoom in a little bit here, just by clicking and dragging. Uh, and if I click down here, I can pan this. So you can see our script execution ended here. And then right away, the main thread in the browser was like, oh, okay, the script execution is done. And now I have a whole bunch of stuff to render, which is all of this purple. Um, and because JavaScript uh, and browsers work with a single thread, um, this is exactly an illustration of what happens when you have a whole bunch of JavaScript computation that needs to happen, is it, it literally takes up all of this time and so if we go from here to here, you know, we're only at 100 milliseconds in this case. But again, this is a contrived example. We are only rendering this amount of things on the page. So you might say, oh, that's not too bad. Um, we got to, uh, you know, use, user can actually interact with the app and, and scrolling is smooth and things like that. And it was like less than 200 milliseconds. But think of this in the context of a bigger application with uh, extra CSS that's controlling things and all of the Chrome or like the sidebar and the toolbar and everything that's surrounding this. And it'll start to add up. So uh, if we think and, and look at this with a performance mindset right away, even if we have this example in isolation, like this is really not a great experience. Um, and as we add the, the sorting functionality, uh, it gets even worse. So if we think about this as our baseline uh, for how long the JavaScript execution took, uh, I think I have a Google spreadsheet open here that we can record some results in. So right now uh, we're at one stateful component. Uh, we haven't, haven't done any of the sorting logic yet, but we can sort of take a profile, a snapshot of this and record um, these values. So like our time to first paint was like 598 milliseconds. And our time to interactive is probably, well, it would be as soon as this finishes. So maybe like 250 milliseconds. Uh, and I, we don't have the sort numbers yet because we haven't implemented that. But right now we're at this one stateful component and performance generally wouldn't scale too well. So um, normally at this point, I would recommend that you consider just reducing the number of nodes on the page, right? You go back to uh, the project manager and you kind of push back and say, hey, this you know, this is our performance baseline. It's already not looking great. It's gonna it's not gonna scale well into the future as we start adding other UI components to this application or even just more functionality um, and more JavaScript execution that's gonna occur on click handlers. Can we like reduce the number of nodes here to uh, like 10 and, and paginate across those or like 20? And then that would really get us to a better performance baseline as we grow. And if you do that early enough in your application's uh, development life cycle, uh, it'll be significantly easier for you to um, 
one, get in the habit of doing this, like just going back and forth and, and profiling things. But then also um, it, it, it gets you this rhythm of I'm going to make some code changes. I'm going to profile and see what impact that has and keeping in mind that frame budget and those things and just being vigilant about it and not delegating all of that to the library and then getting mad when React isn't fast anymore because of, uh, you know, the way that you've irresponsibly coded things. That's kind of what I'm trying to communicate. So let's go implement the sorting logic uh, for the headers and see what kind of a performance baseline we can get there. So we already added the state that we're gonna track, which is how we're sorting, like which column, uh, the sort order, ascending or descending, and then uh, a temporary place in the state that we're gonna store uh, this sorted data. Um, the original data and the column definitions comes from uh, the props that we pass in down here, uh, right there. Um, and so we don't expect those to change significantly, um, but that does come into play a little bit later. So let's add uh, the, the sort of next level. We've got our, our basic component there. Uh, it has some state and it has a, a render method and it's not doing too much, but uh, we wanna add the functionality and then we wanna start going down the path of extracting and refactoring uh, across the lines of reducing the surface area of our render method. Um, loops are a great way to do that. Anywhere you see like a map or a reduce or something that's generating um, execution. So in this case, these JSX elements like a TR is going to get translated to a TR function call because this is just getting compiled to JavaScript. Um, but those are great places to start. But let's start by doing our sort logic. So we need a sort handler. So let's call it do sort. And what we want to do in do sort is we want to get a specific column. Uh, and we to do that, we need to be able to render those columns as headings. So let's do that here. We can say calls.map. You know, and maybe this is another indication that uh, we're just doing too much uh, in this one component because we've essentially duplicated calls.map. And in our table heading, we want to put in um, a table row one table row, because it's going to be the top. And then uh, we want a th, um, where the key is the column, so that we don't hit that performance snag. Uh, and then let's just render out the column. Let's see if that works if we didn't get any problems. All right, there we go. So now we can see we've got our column headings. Sweet, let's implement the sort. Uh, so when we click on those, we're going to say on click equals this dot do sort. And we're going to pass in a column, the, the current column that's being mapped over, actually, because that's the, the column that we want to set. So let's go to do sort and we can say we're going to take in a column. Uh, and we want to return a new function. And that's bound to the column that we have. Uh, and we're going to call set state and we're gonna compute some new states. So we're gonna say, we wanna sort by that column uh, and we wanna figure out what a new sort order is gonna be. And we want to also have our sorted data actually be filtered. So for now, let's just do this. So let's say uh, in here, we want um, that new sort order uh, and we wanna check the existing sort. So this dot state dot sort order if it's the default state, which is an empty string, um, or uh, this.state.sort order is descending, and we'll use a ternary, and we'll say if that's true, then go to ascending, otherwise just go to descending. So that's our new sort order. And we can sort the data by using underscores sort by method. So let's do that and pass in uh, the data, the initial data, um, and sort by will return us a new array. So we're not going to mutate this existing array. And then the column that we want to sort by, and then the new sort order. Uh, and the cool thing about sort by is if we go check out the lodash docs, and we go to sort by, uh, we can see that it takes the collection, which is our data, um, and then it allows us to provide uh, the value for the sort. And I didn't even know this before I started using it, but um, because we're using composite keys, so for example, this might show up something like under the sort by the data and then address 
dot city, um, and then maybe either ascending or uh, descending, something like that. But uh, Lodash uh, will is smart enough, at least the sort by method, to automatically um, compute the path to this key and then reference the value and use that as a sort. And I thought that was kind of cool. So that's all we need for do sort. And let's test if that works, if we didn't have any errors. I'm not sure whether this context was getting lost there, but uh, two, two mistakes. Um, the first was it's not sort by, it's order by, uh, which takes that method signature. So I swapped that out. I had to go look at my cheat sheet. And uh, the other thing was because our UI isn't actually um, binding to the sorted data, that's why nothing was happening. So we are computing the sorted data and getting the order, but uh, we're not using it. So I had destructured it off the state here, but I never used it. So in this case, uh, we want to check uh, if the sorted data dot length, then uh, we want to do sorted data um, or data and then call map on that. And I think that should update our component. So now if we click on return amount, yeah, there we go. And again, we're getting that logging back. Let me just turn that off. Okay, so <laughs> the whole reason we went down this rabbit hole was to get a number for paint and JS execution on sorting. Uh, so, oh, the last thing we want to do is we wanted to add uh, a reset method so that we could just get back to the default state. Um, so we can do that. Uh, we can call that a function that's just going to call this dot set state and pass these values as their defaults. So I think that should work. And then we want to show that in the UI if we actually have um, a value. So above this heading, we can add a conditional or an expression that says sort by Now, if we sort, we get a little button up here, and we can reset the sort and get it back to zero. Cool. So let's get a performance baseline for that functionality. So if we go to performance, and I'm just going to reload the page, and I want to reload with react underscore perf. Now I can do hit the record button. Let's sort by return amount, and we'll flip it the other way, and then we'll hit reset. And let's see what kind of performance metrics we get for that stuff. So let's make this just a little bit bigger. So interestingly, we can see in user timing, here's our table update and our table render. Uh, and if we select this chunk, which I believe is the start of the sort, and you can tell by looking at interactions. So our mouse up it took a really long time because I think the start and the end of that aren't computed until uh, this JavaScript code executes plus the thread in the rendering thread uh, does the painting, which you can see is this purple blob here. Um, so that took 231.45 milliseconds. So we could say that the JavaScript execution time is about that if we wanted to record. Uh, so that's here, 231. 0.45 milliseconds. We'll just call it 231 for now. And then the, the painting portion of that probably took, it's hard to get a real accurate number here. I guess you can get it here, this purple. So like 17 milliseconds here after 
um, this JavaScript was finished executing. And this is just our application code that shows up in the user timing. With React Perf, it eliminates the, uh, the other stuff, the, um, the actual framework code, which is kind of nice, because then you can just see this is exactly how long my code took. So 105 plus 17, so let's say like 100 and 122 milliseconds. So let's see if we can improve that slightly. Uh, and the first place that I talked about was reducing JavaScript execution. But if this is our baseline of functionality and we want to get to a better state for improving performance, uh, let's clear this out. So the first thing uh, we can do, kind of what I talked about in the readme is, so we started big, we built our one component, we have our one render method, and we did a profile. Um, and then we want to decompose and limit the surface area of our component by thinking hard about the props and then profile again. And so what I mean by thinking hard about the props is uh, looking at all the stuff that we have here and thinking, does this render method truly need to recompute everything? Um, because right now it is uh, just by virtue of the fact that we've got uh, a map one, two, three times in here. Uh, if we're sorted, we do it on the sorted data, otherwise, otherwise the regular data. So can we eliminate the surface area of that by extracting some of these pieces? And so one of the clear dividing lines for that is uh, figuring out um, how to create a new component, uh, sort of a boundary, and then pass some props into that. And we can do that in a couple of places. We can do that with our row at this level, and we can do that with our cell at this level. So let's just collapse some of this stuff and sketch out what that looks like. So let's create a row. And we'll do the same for cell. So in a cell, we're just going to get some output determined by the parent. And it's going to be pretty dumb. We're just going to uh, return the rendered output inside of a TD. So that's a simple component. And in the row, um, we're going to get a, a row value and any of the columns because we need to dereference um, the pieces off of that uh, in order to display. In our case, we are technically showing all of the column data, so we could not bother having to pass this prop in, but uh, maybe your API data in a real world example would have more columns than you actually want to show in your table. So let's destructure row and call off the props and then return a table row uh, where we map over the calls to get our TD tags. Actually, in this case, we're going to use the cell and we're going to say output is equal to get row call and we need our key again because we're, otherwise we're going to hit the same thing so let's go and yoink that from below uh, so that's this this key here or sorry this key here And then we're also going to need a key for uh, the row when we put it in. And so what that's going to look like now uh, is we're going to map over the table body. It's going to map over this. And instead of a TR, we're just going to emit a row. Uh, key is row.id. Row equals row. Calls equals calls. See if that works. So that worked. And now that we've refactored that, we should get a different performance baseline. Um, because now we have, uh, instead of a one parent component, we have three components. We have the table, 
which uses children of rows, which internally use the children of cells. And each of those is an opportunity to sort of create a boundary where props can um, be tracked internally by, by React to determine if it needs to re-render these things. So let's go do our performance audit again with the baseline. So we're just going to hit reload. This is highly unscientific uh, in the fact that usually you'd want to uh, do multiple tests uh, without your development bundle, um, as well as uh, so you know testing your staging and your production environment where you're minified uh, and you're not shipping development code. Um, but also uh, we want to um, do more trials so that we're not just doing this once and being one and done. So interestingly, this got way worse, uh, which is not what we wanted. <laughs> which you can kind of see here. Uh, so we see that, let's take a look. DOM content loaded at one second. I think we need to zoom in over here. And I'm using the W, A, S, and D keys to get down to zoom into these things with this window in Chrome DevTools. First paint is at 1.13 seconds and the load event at 1.13 seconds here. Or so we're so down in the timeline that this is like, yeah. So let's say, let's look at our metrics spreadsheet. Um, so with three stateful components, our time to first meaningful paint was like right over here. So One point one three seconds. <laughs> I think it was actually longer than that, but or right, let's keep the units the same. So like a one. And our time to interactive was probably slightly after that, so I don't know, like I guess I guess right there. It's about the same. Well this can't be right, that value can't be less. Maybe it could be less. Actually, I think we just got worse across the board. So let's profile what sorting does. I'm going to throw away this profile and hit record and sort by return amount and reset. And yeah, these frames are pretty bad. And you can see all of these update methods get called granularly for each one of those components. And another great way to see this is to go to the React DevTools for Chrome and hit Highlight Updates and hit this button. And then, oh, did we not actually see anything happen? Oh, there we go. Oh, that was because I'd already sorted that one. Let me reload this one. I guess I should have showed that before we did the extract refactor out to this, but in that case, it would have been doing updates all over the place. So either way, it's still really sluggish. So if we go back to this um, performance analysis, we can see that our update method took 620 milliseconds. So I think that's what we threw in our spreadsheet as just execution time. So that's pretty horrible. 620 milliseconds, and then painting, if we expand the main thread here, 106 plus 17. Interestingly, painting isn't that bad, so painting looks like it maintained consistency. So our JS execution time has gone up, um, which is crappy, uh, and the reason is we, have, we created a couple of extra functions, um, and we extended from React component, and each of those then has a really small slice of uh, time in the stack here and it's going to get called individually. So each of those row updates functions will get called and then there's a bunch of cell update functions that will get called. And so this flame chart is indicative of a lot happening and we want to use that uh, as an indication that we need to figure out 
how to optimize this. So there's a couple of ways that we can do that. One is, uh, if we look at the spreadsheet, um, we can continue with stateful components and then we can uh, inherit from something called react.peer component. And if we did that, then uh, that would make React's algorithm that determines if it needs to update compare shallowly on the props. And if we think about the props that we're passing in, uh, we're passing row and columns. Columns is probably static. It's never going to change. So really, we only care uh, about the value for row, uh, at least in the context of, um, of row. And then a cell, the same thing. Um, the output is probably not going to change at all. So I don't even know if this needs to be a stateful component right now. So if we make the change, if we go to our next list and we go with the next refactor that we want to do is we want to take anything that doesn't necessarily need state or optimize it to be one stateful and two stateless components. So let's make these components stateless. And we can extend from react.peer component. And so here was our baseline at 620 milliseconds for the sort. Let's see what happens when we do it now. It was significantly faster. Yeah, so we shrunk just by doing that, we shrunk it down to 59.84 milliseconds on the table update uh, because um, not all of those render methods uh, needed to be called um, after they were called the first time because the, the output of them wasn't changing. And so by extending from React up here component, we made the comparison on the props shallow. It's not going to go deep uh, into um, each one of these pieces, like the columns array and the row array. So if this hasn't changed, React's diffing algorithm will say, hey, this hasn't fundamentally changed since the last time I re-rendered you. The only thing that's really changing is the position. Uh, and because we provided the, the key property, uh, it can optimized by saying, I don't need to re-render these elements. I'm just changing the position of them in the DOM. So this is a, a decent first step at optimizing. Um, we could also make these stateless functional components, which we can do next. But let's let's record our, um, our updated values. So we got 59.84 milliseconds. So like, let's say 60 milliseconds. Uh, on the sort JS execution. And the painting, I believe, probably still look, took roughly the same amount of time. So yeah, 112 plus 18 is like 130 milliseconds. So we decreased our render execution time by like a factor of 10, roughly, which is pretty good just by extending from React up peer component and um, being smart about how we did that uh, by extracting the components. And let's do a full page profile as well. Did we improve anything in this regard? So we st the, the, the thing that's interesting is because of our um, abstractions, our first time to render incurs a greater cost because uh, it has to go through and call mount and render uh, for each one of those child components. So we are at 593.99 milliseconds. Um, so our one second. So we shaved a second off roughly. And I think I had used the time to interactive as like the time when this was there, but really the user wouldn't be able to do anything until this is here. So I think this is probably around, yeah, that's right around the second mark. So that's the, that's a reasonable estimate. Uh, React up here component is what we had done here. Actually, I think these numbers are from this. Let's do, let's do one state and two stateless components. And stateless functional components are uh, components that look just like functions. So we could say const cell equals destructure the output. And then 
we can just return. And I think if we actually omit these braces, we can do that. Uh, so can we do this here? And stateless functional components are just the result of returning their props. Let's see if this works. I may have a syntax error, but looks like it worked. So let's do the same performance metrics. Let's get our initial baseline. So we hit our Nine hundred and seventy one milliseconds, so like slightly faster. And let's do sort. And I forgot to hit record. Let me reload the page. And I suspect we'll get worse performance. What's the profile loads? So there was our click. So 355.33 milliseconds. So yeah, it is worse um, because now we've gotten rid of um, optimizations that React does when you inherit from pure component. And there are other ways that you can do that if you want to use a stateless functional component. One of those is a library called Recompose. And so if, you, if you're if you set on using stateless functional components, um, you can import pure from Recompose. Now let me record these numbers first. So 355.33, so 355 milliseconds. Uh, this is JavaScript execution. And our paint this is about the same 124. So our painting, our painting hasn't changed, which is kind of expected because it's not changing the number of nodes. Um, just we're making changes based on the JS execution time and optimizing there. So let's see what recompose pure does. And the way that we do that is we mark these as pure. Let's do our initial profile. One point three eight seconds. So that was actually worse. And it's probably not interactive till yeah, right at the end of this JavaScript execution. So like it's almost like one point five seconds. Let's see how the paint works. Sort. Sort, reset. That's interesting to me. It didn't achieve the same performance as extending from React up pure component. So yeah, our execution time for the sort is 79 milliseconds. And paint time was 106 plus, so like 124 again. So our best, like again, this is unscientific because we are um, not doing a number of trials, but 
we don't have time to do that and I don't have an automated testing to do, tool to do that. It would be really great if Chrome DevTools allowed you to do some automated testing around this. But uh, the goal wasn't to show you a purely scientific method for um, doing performance testing. Uh, I think the goal here was just to show you uh, a few different ways that you can slice up your React components and uh, that you can do profiles in between. And a simple approach like this, just recording the data in a spreadsheet, um, gives you some interesting metrics, even if they're not uh, a, great, a good enough sample size to make sweeping judgments. Um, at least in my case, I can see that if I have one stateful uh, or three stateful components, but I use the react.peer component optimization, that seems to yield the best performance optimization uh, when it comes to um, the sort method. But when it comes to the initial ref, uh, render method, it looks like one stateful component uh, is got the best bang for your buck. And so I guess the next step would be figuring out, um, is it worth it to introduce server-side rendering into this uh, equation to eliminate the execution time, uh, you'd still pay the paint cost, which remained roughly the same across all of these different optimizations. Um, but maybe having the code be generated server side uh, and then React hooking up later so that you get the really fast optimization for um, the sorting operation, which is going to occur client side anyways, uh, maybe that's the right way to slice it. Um, and so the goal wasn't to make uh, make you think that this is the silver bullet for React performance. The goal was just to show you different optimizations that you can make in this um, in this way and get you thinking about this and that loop of feedback and, and using the tools to, to do that. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure I probably made like some numeric mistakes even as recording because like there was a gap between once we finished one stable component and went to this one. Um, but you know, forgive me for the the errors in numbers or tracking or however I did it, but uh, the method by which you do this is kind of what I wanted to communicate. And so I hope this allows you to objectively evaluate the performance of your code and not immediately lean on a, a library abstraction, um, but dig into what your code is doing and how to optimize it in a few different ways under the hood. Thanks for watching.